fellas right in here, huh? You working there? Where are you fellas from? Take with each other, right? Come here. Hey, what's this? They fly the 13 miles away in Berkeley. How about that? Fly the 13 miles away in Berkeley. So what? What are you talking about? A birthday's a birthday. It is, but on Friday the 13th, can you take that? Did hey, you see the paper there? Can I just go? Yeah. About what? Did you get my beat when I started? Yeah. Oh, I saw the uh, uh, I just got to looking at the uh, uh, examiner. They had the pictures in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we'd like to get a little bit more into the um, prison life, you know. Just like prison life. At lunch, you know, you're in prison now. You know, you tell us about the lunch. A lot of times before, when we're off camera, you know, you show your sense of humor and yourself and everything like that. So this time, you know, come on out and be natural. Show all the sides of yourself that you are. You know. <laughs> what about the program? Huh? Are you asked about this prison life? I'm going to ask about your prison life, and I'm going to ask about, you know, the Panthers, and mix the two. So, when we get through with this film, we'll be able to bring a picture back to the people of who Bobby Seale is in prison. Mm -hmm. And the thing that struck me last time when I was here is I expected you to be positive. I didn't know what to expect, that you might have been broken down, and you might, they might have driven you crazy or cracked you. Mm -hmm. The thing that's impressive to me and a lot of people that saw the footage the first time was that you're alive and well, and you're you know, surviving the pressure that they put on you, you know, mm -hmm. all these different forms. So, where did you just come from now, down the hall? Well, they just brought me out of my, um, well, the cell they keep me in, that it's a cell that I'm isolated, you know, from all the other prisoners in the jail. Yeah. And, um, I've been in there reading the papers, this morning's papers, and, uh, just before that, I was out to see my lawyer about um, the local superior court. Uh, not uh, just, you know, just they got it so operating that they just almost threw the uh, uh, habeas corpus aside, you know, so we could at least it was a habeas corpus for a hearing, you know, concerning uh, this extradition that uh, Regan and call it self making. Um, yeah, okay, we'll get into that exhibition a little bit a little bit later. What about um we missed the food part. What did you have for lunch today in jail? I have some more of that soup. We have a it's just a thing of soup, you know. Uh, some days it's uh what they call potato soup. And some days it's what they call it's a kind of green greenish looking marsh or split pea soup. What well, they feed it to you in? Well, you have a, a metal pan, like, almost, and it's about an inch in depth, you know, and about five inches in diameter, the bowl part of it. And, uh, so that's what you have to eat? and bread, yeah. And you eat that usually every day? I don't eat it all, but I throw it in the toilet. <laughs> what I do is they have a commissary here where you have money on the books. You know, people leave you money. Yeah. Uh, where you can buy cigarettes, where you can also buy uh, milk. I buy a quart of milk. I have a coal. And you have so a coal now? Yeah, I have a coal. And, uh, well, it's going away a little bit, but they have little cartons of uh, orange juice you can buy. So I want that vitamin C, you know, mm -hmm. to keep buying. So I buy a couple of those and a quart of milk. And then they have, uh, you can buy some candy, you know, and your cigarettes. And then they have some crackers. And the Ritz crackers, cheese kind or something that they don't sell out there on the market, I guess, much. And they let us, they sell them up here. And uh, I bought a box of those, you know. And uh, sometime I'll eat and nibble off this. Peanuts, they have a little package, five little packages of peanuts. Mm -hmm. And um, well, instead of eating that soup, I generally throw it in the toilet. The soup and bread. Eat the cracker. Yeah, instead of eating the soup and bread, I eat the. Uh, crackers and drink some milk. Sometime uh, I might take two or three spoons of the soup. Yeah. And they have some green salad sometimes they chop up and throw on a plate. And uh, if, it's, if it's got any kind of dressing on it, I'll eat it. If it don't, I throw it, I generally throw it away. Like if you really had your choice of what you would eat, you know, if you're really in there, you know. Like last time you said you wanted some, you know, some soul food. And if you would, you know, and you went into this whole thing of describing yeah. what, well, you know, what would you eat if you could have something to eat. Well, I'm a cook. I can cook, see? So what would you cook? Well, I'd cook. If I was out, 
of jail, I like to, I've been in jail now about six months. I like to go home and uh, get my wife and we'll go down to uh, the co-op market somewhere and uh, we'll buy uh, some cube steaks, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Some nice little thick cube steaks, you know? And uh, bell peppers, onions, and all this other stuff, you know? And I'd go home, I'd do the cooking more than likely. Me and we cook together. But you do most of the cooking at all? No, I don't do most of the cooking. I would do the cooking when I really want to eat something that I want to eat, you know, uh, the way I want to cook. When she, she can cook, she learned how to cook. When she first met, all she could cook was spaghetti, you see? <laughs> So uh, I do 50% of the cooking now. She learned how to cook, you know, uh, by me helping her, teaching her how to cook, you know. Well, I had to learn how to cook when I was in L.A. when I was living by myself, see. And uh, well, I had to learn how to cook what I could, you see, because I really didn't have no money. I was hung up one time and just broke, you know. But uh, what I cook is uh, I take me some cube steaks, flour them down, season salt them down, pepper them down, and uh, then I douse them in uh, some flour and I put them in a pan of hot grease, you know, about four of them. And uh, as they brown on one side, I flip them over. Then I cut up a whole onion, slice rings, on rings of onions, and I cut up some rings of bell pepper, you know. And then uh, drop a lid on top of it, you know, <laughs> and lower the flat fire down, you know, and let it go slow. And uh, meanwhile, the uh, ham ends or bacon ends is already boiling. It's already been boiling at least, you know, 30 minutes, you know, mm -hmm. on a high fire. And I drop uh, some, uh, either some fresh shell black eyed peas in there, but a frozen black eyed peas, which I prefer, you know. Actually, I've even put them on before I dropped the meat in, you know, because the way I'm going to do this. But uh, I got these black eyed peas going, you know, with a little bell pepper in there, you know, and. Uh, <laughs> I uh, would uh, season it down righteous, you know, black pepper and all that stuff. I like highly seasoned stuff, you know. Then I got this pan of rice aroni cooking. See, I've got this three or four slabs of butter in the bottom of this pan. It's just melting, and I throw this rice around and let it brown over, you know. And, and boom, throw all this stuff in. And I take three tomatoes, four, uh, one tomato, you know, after the rice steams up inside, you know. I put the water in, put the little herbs and all that stuff, this beef rice aroni, you see. And after comes up, I take a tomato on top of the rice, stir it up, and then let it steam a little bit, and I take a tomato and slice it all up, and put the slices all over the top of the, uh, the uh, rice, and put the lid back on it, you know, and then let it sit there, you know, and real low fine let that juices from the tomato simmer down into the rice, you see? And uh, I have some cornbread, you know, <laughs> and uh, I like a tall, cold glass of milk, you see? And uh, when that cornbread is hot, the rice aroni is hot, you know, and everything is cooking. What I do, I take the meat out of the pan, and I put four or five tablespoons of pot, uh, flour in the bottom of the pan. Uh, it'd be equated with the amount of uh, grease, you know, and the juices and seeped out of the meat, you know, into that. And, you know, it's kind of cooked too, you know. And you let the flour brown, you see. And then that's when I go to my thing, you know. I get me a uh, half a bottle of steak sauce, you know, and dump it in there some hot sauce and dump it in there, and some peppers out of a jar and dump it in there, a little more seasoning sauce, salt it down and taste it. You don't have to taste your food, you see. It tastes good, boom. And take all the meat and put it back in the pan, you see. Mm -hmm. Cut up a few more onions, a few more bell peppers, you see. Tomato maybe, you know. Boom, and put the uh, lid back on there and just let it simmer there, you know what I mean, for about 20 minutes. Everything is nice and hot. And that's what I have, some cornbread with butter, in between it, some black eyed peas, the ham ends, the bacon ends, or whatever you got in there, or a ham hock, you have to boil it a little early, you know what I mean, get it done, you know, and I agree, man. <laughs> I like to get down to it. That's, that's where it's at to me. Country brown, uh, cube steaks smothered down in country brown, country brown gravy. Uh -huh. Black eyed peas and rice around it with all the gravy I want to put on it, you know, with all the way I got the season just the way I like it. And a tall glass of milk. And, uh, I can see why you threw your simp away after all that. I mean, I, that's, I like to eat. You know, one time, a long time ago, somebody asked me what I'd rather have. I was down in Los Angeles at the time uh, when I was trying to make it 10 years ago. And uh, he asked me what I'd rather have. Would I rather have a Cadillac or would I rather have a, 
uh, a refrigerator full of food, you dig? And you know, you think about this, you know, um, I like to eat, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have a lot of these things, you know. We get a piece of steak, uh, it was a little bitty piece of steak, and it was far and far in between, you know. And Mama would hustle up a skinny chicken for Sunday, you see. And Daddy, he's around working here and there, but uh, we didn't get much meat. We eat a lot of greens and black-eyed peas and cornbread, you what know. Was that in yeah, I raised up right out there in Berkeley, Cornelius Village, the ghetto over there. And Were you in Cornelius Village? I lived I remember that. Remember the Busy Bee Cafe? Yeah, I remember. You talking about on 9th and uh, what's yeah. it? Harrison. Yeah. Yeah, I lived on 6th and Harrison. And they finally tore that place down. Yeah, I know they tore the whole place down. That's where I was raised up at. Man. And uh, see, I remember my mom used to bring in and stuff. And I think about people who are hungry, you know. And uh, I think about people. Uh, that's why Breakfast for Children's where it's at, man, you know. Mm -hmm. Because in the morning, like you eating grits. I mean, I like, I like to eat breakfast, you know what I mean? I want three or four slices of something that some thick bacon, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't like that a little dainty, thin bacon. But I eat it, you know, it's sweet and it's good, you know. But uh, some grits and some butter, you know what I mean? Some hot biscuits or some jelly or some syrup, one way or the other, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where it's at. And I think every little kid in the country should have it, you know? Sausages, if you want ham slabs and grits and butter and jelly and biscuits. You know, we make toast with placing the butter, this is where I was raised up. You put the butter on the uh, uh, bread, you know. I don't dig toaster bread. Toaster, you know, we put, you know, they take the toast and they put it in a little toaster, you know. Well, I ain't the way we do it. I wasn't where I was raised, because we didn't have no toasters. So we had to put it under the flame in the oven, you know. And we still do it. We like it that way. We're so used to tasting spats of butter on top of the bread and sliding in the oven, you dig? And then it toasts right, nice and hot, and the toast is nice, and the butter melts down, and you come in nice and hot, you know what I mean? And I hated margarine, you know? The reason I hated margarine, even when I was a kid, I knew it was a fake, you see? And uh, it wasn't real butter, you see what I mean? And I kind of adopted this from my daddy. He didn't want nobody's margarine. He wanted real butter. And my mother likes real butter, you know? They come up, they, they was come up on the farm when they was young, too, you know? And um, butter, man, on that rice, and scrambled eggs or sunny side up eggs. Just take me some pile of rice with all the butter in it I want and two or three sunny side up eggs on top of that. And some smoked sausages or some bacon. What about in the jail? Do you ever talk about this food? In oh, man. I talked about this one night, man. The cats told me to be quiet. <laughs> I got to talk one time describing the meal. You know, I was hollering down the block to some other brothers that I talked to. Yeah. and Los Siete and them brothers. And they get to describe and stuff, you know. And, they was talking about how they make chili. I make chili too, you know, roast beef, all that stuff. Stew, love to cook stew. Like when we in the Panther party, you know, the Panther houses? Uh -huh. Drop over to the Panther house, or at my house, or up at the top of the Panther headquarters office, you know. Got a kitchen back there. That's where it's at. <laughs> I mean, you know, you grease, you know. <laughs> and so I tell the brothers there's some chili, you know, and everybody gets together and we eat food is, is life, man, you know. And I relate, I relate to things, you know. That. What, what about Los Fiestas? You, you can't see any other prisons, can you? No, the only time I see them cats, man, is when uh, they lawyer. Well, they lawyers, my lawyer. They, they, you know, I call them out, but one of the lawyers working along with Gary as a crew will call them out, and they pass by no, myself. I mean, anybody, you see any of the other prisons where you are? Yeah, I can see them when they pass by myself. Uh -huh. Or when they come down to take a shower, they might have shower day like tomorrow, see, on mm -hmm. Saturday. And uh, they'll come down and the process of them taking that five, quick five-minute shower. See, the, this shower cell is kind of like next to my cell, but it's to my left. I really can't see in the shower. But as they come and get ready to go in, they say, Power Bobby, you know, what's happening, brother? I say, right on, you know. Well, Mr. Ramos, you know, we will win. And uh, we be talking about a lot of things, man. We talk about the fact that we've got to raise defense funds and things like that, you know. And uh, the fact that the people struggle out there in the streets, what's happening, you know. And we've got to organize the people and let the people organize around the programs and unify around these programs, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, breakfast for children, free health clinic, well, all of them. You think the prisoners in there understand, you know, the most of them are most of them hip to what you're talking about? I think a lot of them are not motivated. Uh, I think uh, a lot of them just don't know, really. They know some kind of way, but they're not able to articulate how it's really the power structure. You know, the average is greedy businessmen and the demagogic power. They're not how, hip. How, how do you know this? How do I know? Yeah. I mean, how does it make yourself evident? 
It makes it self-evident that uh, you can distinguish between two different kinds of prisoners, you know. You can distinguish to the kind of prisoner who has some political thinking. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you do that? When you first come into the cell block, when you walk on there, how do you know which, which uh, prisoners have a political consciousness and which are the other ones? Some of them, a lot of them ask me, brother, what's going on? They just don't know. You know, they know me, they heard about me, you know, they heard about the party, you know, they heard about Huey and all of us, you know, contributing together. And uh, they just outright asked you, you know, what's going on, you see? It's a lot of them. Do they yell it down the halls or do they? Well, they might pass by the cell or they're waiting to come out this little gate to come out and see their lawyer. They might be there about two, three minutes, you know. I rap to them, you know, stuff like that. They ask me questions. Then there's brothers that know a lot of what's happening, you know. And he comes right on in, you know. He'd be talking about uh, what Regan did and what you think about that. And he just, you know, relating his knowledge. We trade knowledge, like, you know. And uh, he's talking about the fact that the budget for welfare in the state is lower than the budget for prisons, you know. These brothers know this. He's on all this information. Yeah, man. These cats, lots of, some cats know this stuff, man. It's, uh, you know, and uh, it's very important stuff. Regan, you know, indir directly and indirectly, man, how are all the rejects, and these cats are hip, how the rejects on the adult authority, the cats are rejects, man. Mad dog, mad and the ex-policemen, ex-DAs, you know, they kind of rejects, you know, they ain't got, and they, they, run the, they run the prison system, man. They're rejects from where? Rejects in terms of uh, not being the best educated to run the prisons or not being the best educated in society, you see what I mean? Last time we were here we were talking about um, what it was like in the hole and that was sort of graphic and we missed that. Would you go over that again in all the way you told it, you know, and all your expressions and everything about what it was like in, when you were in the hole? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Y'all got no smoke, right? Cigarette? Anybody got a cigarette? Don't, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Okay. Just like one three right there. Yeah, got match. Uh well well I was putting a hole. Well, I have to tell you how it started. You see, this um this uh guard gave me or let me have the Black Panther Party paper. Yeah, there you go. after Gary had requested, you know, him to let me have it. And uh I took the paper. Gary had told the guard that he wanted me to read over three or four articles because they're going to. He wanted me to make some notes on them and stuff like that, and some of my statements and everything. He said because uh, he felt that in some of the couple of future cases that the DA was going to try to turn the meaning of them around, so he wanted to get them down now. You know, and uh, I took the paper. God let me have it. It was one night when my lawyer came up to see me, and uh, next day, or two days later, I think. Uh, I was in visiting, and so I come back from visiting. Visiting was over for that Sunday. That's what it was. And the cat told me, he says, uh, Seal, you ain't supposed to have that Black Panther Party paper now. I said, wait a minute, man. I say, uh, it's another guard, you know. I say, you just investigate. I say, one of the guys let me have the paper, you know. That's contraband. I said, oh, man, wait a minute. I say, if a guard gave it to me, I said, he gave it to me after requesting my lawyer to make some notes for some legal matters, you know. That don't make no difference. I said, now wait a minute. I said, you're supposed to investigate. You know what I mean? And what you doing with the Jet Magazine? I said, what Jet Magazine? You know? He said, we found a Jet Magazine. I said, no. I said, you ain't found no Jet Magazine. He said, we got it. I said, look, man. I said, all these cats is running around here. They're going to visit and stuff like this. I said, the cats probably threw the Jet Magazine. I said, because they're always giving me something. They're always throwing something in here, you know? And he says, well, that's contra, man. I said, well, man. I said, that's one thing. I said, but uh, as far as the paper go, he said, well, you're going to get your visit taken. I said, no, wait a minute, man. I said, you got to investigate. And he says, no. He said, we don't have to do nothing. I said, well, then if you don't investigate, I said, that means you violate my rights by taking my visits away. I said, so if you don't investigate, you're a bunch of low-life, scurvy, reprobated pigs. I said, and I don't go for it. And uh, that's the way I feel about it. And so, uh, well, you can't call us a pig. We'll take visits away from you from next week and next week just for that. I say pig a thousand times, pig a million times. As long as you violate my constitutional rights or my rights to my visit, any kind of human rights I got, I say just because you won't investigate, I say you can solve the stuff. I say I consider you a pig until you do. And so uh, they didn't like it. And uh, cats started arguing with me, talking with me. I had some cups in there. 
There's an extra cup in, in my cell, you see? And uh, the cat with the food wagon, see, they feed you in your cell. He went around out on D block, on A block. He come in on D block. He happened to went around out on A block instead of coming back out and picking up my cup. Because, see, I'm outside of the lockup for D block. You see, I'm in an isolated cell away from everybody, see? What are you done with these cups in your cell? This cup here in your cell. What you gonna do, write something for your lawyer? I look at this dude. I say, look, man. I say, uh, how can you be so stupid to ask such an unintelligible question as that as to be supposedly writing something for a lawyer with a damn cup? I say, now how can you be that stupid, man? I say, I'm not, I say, I'm more intelligent than that. I said, only, I say, I want you to investigate about whether or not I got contraband in my cell and I come to the get. I say, here you come ask them stupid, unintelligible. I said, that's just the way you pigs think. You know what I mean? I said, you don't want to believe me. I said, but if you go check it out, you'll find out that, um, that our, uh, the cat actually didn't have the Black Panther Party paper. And so, uh, boom, the next morning, man, they come to take me to the hole. <laughs> And so, like up there, 10 of them there, crowded all around in front of my side. I see you moving cells. I said, moving cells? I said, oh, I said, okay. So let me get my property. Oh, no, that's all right, John. I said, wait a minute. I said, if I'm moving cells, I said, I want my envelopes and my property and my candy and my cigarettes and everything and my legal stuff here. So I started picking it up. No, 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 no. So there's one cat. Ah, I'll take care of that. I said, no. I said, in other words, I said, you're taking me to the hole, ain't you? I say, that's what you're doing, talking about I'm moving cells. I say, I'm still taking my property. So I snatched my property up. I say, I'm definitely taking my legal stuff. So I come on out of the cell. I say, let's go. Walked on around here and went on down there. We got down there, so they say, uh, all right, or, uh, give us all your stuff. I say, you don't get my legal stuff. I say, you don't get none of my legal papers. I say, because by constitutional right, I say, I got it right. Any person accused in hell and jail got a right to keep all things related to his legal defense with him. I said, you know that. You can't have that no more. I said, yeah, I'm going to keep it. I said, the only way you're going to get it from me is take it from me. I said, because I'm keeping my legal stuff. So I said, you can have all this other stuff. I said, you can put that away. I said, my legal papers I keep with me. And so I said, let's go to the hole. So I started walking towards the hole. And so they all jumped in. They all kind of, excuse me, they jumped in front of me. You know what I mean? And uh, so you got to give me, I said, you know, I ain't going to give you my legal papers. I said, I got a right to have my legal papers. So I started to walk towards the hole again. And all of them cats grabbed me simultaneously, legs, hands, and everything, and right around the neck and started choking me and pulling me to the ground. We were wrestling there for a while. And, and then this cat started hitting me in the testes. This one cat who talked about, don't worry about your stuff. You know, let's just go, you know, when you get ready to put me in the hole. And man, I was passing out, you know, and the cat was choking me, man. And uh, he hit me four times, man. And I remember the last time as I was just going on out, you know. And that pissed me off. You know, and I had a TV interview, and he was standing back out there listening. And I saw him listening. I said, I don't know if they even showed on TV. I said, but they said they put me in a hole for calling him a pig. I said, well, the punk, the bastard who put me in the hole and hit me in the balls and the testes, I said, I still consider him a low life that scary, reprobated pig. I don't know if they put that on TV or not, but that's the way I felt about it, and that's exactly what he is. And that's what he is this, this badge 41 or the sheriff's department, you see? And I got his badge number and everything, you see? The food, you know? And I just wanted to print it in the paper so all the people in the community can know who the pig is, you know? But anyway, they put me in this hole. I woke up. What does it look like, the hole? Well, I woke up, I, oh, the holes are seven by seven. No, oh, seven by five, by five feet wide and seven feet long. Mm -hmm. It's just a box, there's no bed in there, you have no blankets in there, you have no toilet, you don't even have a toilet in there. All you got is a hole in the floor. It's a box. Well, he strangled me and to my damn throat. You know, I'm, I'm still hoarse now from that very strangle. I'm thinking about suing. Well, I was choked. After I was choked, and I just w woke up. I was in the hole, you know, and they threw some, uh, oh, you don't have nothing on. You don't have no underwear on, no socks, no shoes. And they give you a shirt, but the shirt is raggedy. The, the stuff they got in there, they got you clothes with holes in it. But a lot of cats ain't even in the hole got raggedy stuff on in here, you know. But, uh, I woke up in a hole, so I uh, my throat, man, I was hoarse. And the, you know, what shocked me the most, when I came to, I couldn't utter a word. That's how bad they choked me. And all they had a tonsillitis problem, see. And uh, they choked me, they wouldn't even let me go see, uh, I wanted to get a, get the doctor, you know, to uh, go through my throat. Dr. Fine, my own private doctor, or Dr. Carlton Goodlett, one of the two of them. 
but they wouldn't let me go see. But anyway, uh, these cats were sitting there, and I was, they were standing there in the front, and they was getting ready to close the door. I couldn't utter, utter a word. I thought, I tried to say something, and that shocked me. I thought I wasn't going to be able to speak no more, man. That blew my mind. Pissed me off. Tell my man. And finally, after about 10 minutes in there, I said, and one of the cats came back and asked me, did I want some water? I said, yeah, I want some water. You know, and um, I got some water in my throat. And then I real, real hoarse, like, you know, so on, so on, so on, so on. That's, that's, that's how my throat was the first day. And it swelled up, and I started running a temperature, you know, that tonsillitis and stuff, and everything. So how did, how did you go to the, to the bathroom in the hole? You said that. Well, we see, well, in the hole, man, this is the, you know, that hole is, 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 is declared unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court, but they still use it. They lie and say they don't, but they do. They're always putting cats in the hole, always brutalizing them, beating them. You know? Like the other night, well, you know the cat Raymond Scott? No. You heard of Raymond Scott, who supposedly killed all them people, who's accused of it at least. Oh, down in Marcus? The black cat, yeah, man. Mm -hmm. Show you how he's rotten, man, one of these black cats in there, these black guys. He tried to go in on Raymond Scott, man and brutalized the cat, messing with him, you know. And then, uh, what did he man, he went and called a bunch of other guards, man, and went in there and they jumped on him, man, by nine or 10 of them, beat the cat, man. Beat him unconscious in this jail. Now the man, Gary, he's a friend of Charles Gary's too, who killed his three daughters. It don't bother him, see. Nobody bothers him, you know. He's a friend of Charles Gary? Yeah, he, well, he been know, he know all the lawyers in town. He know all the people in the government around here. You know, he's a clerk, the kid who killed his three children. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess he uh, needs some mental help, you know. And so, you know what they'll do? They will uh, probably send Raymond Scott, who probably needs some mental help, to the gas chamber. But the white man, you see what I mean? They'll send him to a mental institution. You see what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. this is, well, anyway, back to the whole man. The hole has got a hole in the floor. It's just a flat hole, you know, you flow and it's just a hole. And one of the things about it, they had the thing stopped up. They don't flush, you can't flush it from inside. You flush this flush from outside by somebody else. The thing was stopped up. So I was in there about uh, half an hour or so, and it flushed, but it was stopped up in a defecation and urinal, urinal and toilet paper and crap come all back up in the floor. And I'm standing in two inches of water now with defecation and everything, you know. So I watch, uh, this little porthole, you know, got thick glass on it, you know, you can see through it like so. So I'm watching and see if somebody passing. Every once in a while, I try to bang on this door, but it's almost soundproof, you know. People can hear you kind of banging on it, but not much. Tell these dudes this damn thing is stopped up in here, you know. And, you know, and fall apart. And the cats knew they were stopped up. They knew it, you know. And not too late that night, man. When the shift had changed, you see what I mean? One of the guards had got some human sense. In fact, they'd given me some food in, the, in a plate and through the little porthole. You see, what the water recedes, flushes up and it sits there for an hour. You know, it takes an hour for it to recede back down and they flush it back up. So where were you all the time? You were Every the hour and a half. Yeah, I was in the middle of the crap, you know, until the stuff receded and I could sit back on the floor, possibly. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't stand up all that time, you know? Yeah. And, uh, Were you hanging up on the bars and stuff? Trying to there's no bars. It's a box. It's a box. It's a box. There's no hole. It's a door. A big, thick door. A big, thick steel door, you know. And it's a cold floor. You have to sleep on the cold floor. You don't have no bed in the hole. It's not a... It's a seven, seven feet long, five feet wide box. So what you, what'd you do to keep yourself fit or to keep yourself sane when you're in there? Oh, in the hole? Yeah. You see, this is where you beat the cat. See, when you're revolutionary, you don't, uh, you know, they can't break your spirit that way. You see what I mean? Uh, the real thing is you understand the psychology of the cops. They are the ones who really couldn't stand to be in there. That's why they create that kind of thing. You see what I mean? They are the ones who really couldn't stand to be in there. Anyway, my food came in there. They got some food in there. And what it was is the way they got that thing turned off, unstopped that, that plug and that hole. And me, I have said, sitting and stuff is, on the night shift, after they come back around to pick up the thing, I wouldn't hand me a uh, plate back out the porthole, you see. And uh, they open the door, and I'm over here in the corner, you know, and my plate is sitting there and all this water, defecation and crap, 
all over the floor. I look and I say, now, nah. is that, is, is, I say, I say, I say, I say is, this, is this you can't hold? You know, and so he said, come on out of that. So they cleaned it up and unflushed the thing and got the thing all cleaned out. But uh, it's their minds, that they're scared of that hole, you see. They're the ones who could never take it, you see. But Huey one time was telling me about how he figured they psych out. When he was in jail a long time ago, way before the party started, they put him in the hole because he let a, a, a strike in jail for better food, you know. And uh, what they did, they stuck you in a hole and they give you a cup of green marsh and mess, you know, and two pieces of bread or something twice a day. And so when they first come around there, he would say, I'm not going to eat this crap, you know, because uh, I was striking upstairs for better food in the first place. What I looked like eating this crap you kept sitting out here in the first place. So he would threw it back out for two days, he wouldn't eat. But so happened, the shift changed and uh, a night shift cat changed. And the cat who came on night shift happened to be a brother who knew me and Huey very well, you know, at Mary College, you know. And this cat, I saw Huey down there and asked Huey, was he hungry? Uh, well, he didn't even ask him what he was hungry. What it was, he just went and got some bologna and cheese sandwiches, you know, and uh, brought them down and gave them to Huey at night. And every night he'd come on. So the next day, where Huey figured out these cats psychic was uh, that they are, uh, come down there and it blew their minds. Which when Huey come down, they come down the next day with their green marsh, Huey would be doing push-ups, you know. You know, and then you know how this cat, this cat did that for 10 days and it blew these cat's minds, you know. How could he do it? You know, it's just impossible, you know. Well, you would reverse the understanding of his thinking. The first thing is a basic fear. It's impossible to survive in the hole. You're supposed to break your spirit, you know what I mean? But you don't do that, see. And uh, once you understand that their psychology, deep down inside, they can say everything they want to say, but them cops are really scared of that hole. That's why they create something that they fear, you see what I mean? Which makes them hate. It's a basis of hate and false fears that they have. So they create the most detrimental things. That's the basis of hate. You see, you see how they, you can describe their hate, you see. So how did you whip the psycho in when they came back? 